Hello, my name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the academic director and founder of the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. Uh, welcome to uh, the virtual reading group where we are reading Hannah Arendt's book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Today we are going to be looking at chapter eight, which is in the imperialism section, and it's called uh, Continental Imperialism, the Pan Movements. Um, within the context of Arendt's thinking on totalitarianism, this is clearly one of the key chapters. Uh, she announces that at the very beginning of the chapter, uh, where she writes in the first sentence, Nazism and Bolshevism, or more to Pan-Germanism and Pan-Slavism, respectively, than to any other ideology or political movement. Nazism and, and, and uh, Bolshevism, the two forms of totalitarianism at issue in this book, are rooted in and owe more to Pan-Slavism and Pan-Germanism than any other ideology. Um, Pan-Slavism and Pan-Germanism, we should know, and you'll know as you read the book, are part of our two um, movements uh, that sweep through uh, Eastern Europe and Europe in the 1920s, uh, 30s, uh, and into the 40s. Uh, they have as their fundamental root the idea of a unity of all Germans or all Slavs. Pan meaning all. All Germans, all Slavs. Uh, the idea here is that there's not um, a sense of belonging to a, a nation state. We're not a member of Germany or Austria or not a member of Serbia or Russia. We're Slavs. And so it's important for us to know that for Arendt, um, the pan movements are once again not nationalist movements. Um, are, they're certainly not nation state movements. And they are what she calls tribal nationalism, uh, as opposed to nation states, which see nations as attached to states. Um, the pan movements are tribal nationalist movements. Um, the, the, the chapter is broken up into three parts. The first part is on tribal nationalism, which deals with the pan idea of pan movements. The second chapter, second part of the chapter is on the administrative bureaucratic state. It's entitled The Inheritance of Lawlessness. And um, it's about, it's in a sense a continuation of the last section of the race and bureaucracy chapter into the um, imperialism and pan movements chapter. And it's about the way in which uh, these imperialist movements um, were aimed at breaking apart the state and the legal apparatus of the state and seeking to replace it with rule by decree, which is what she calls bureaucratic rule. And then the third part is on the movement element of the pan movements, and it's about the way that these movements all explicitly identified themselves as movements over and against as parties and what that means and why it's important. So the first part on the pan movements, the tribal nationalism, um, uh, for her it's absolutely essential that we understand that these movements were against the nation state. Uh, they were part of what she calls an enlarged tribal consciousness that seeks to unite all peoples of a similar folk or origin. Um, and, and that is really uh, what the pan movements were. Um, I guess it's important for us to think about that in relationship to nationalism today. Uh, we hear a lot about nationalism, uh, both in Europe and in the United States and, and elsewhere. And, and, and what Arendt is really saying is these, these tribal nationalisms are different from nationalism. And paying attention to that is absolutely central to, to understanding our text. So on page 223, 
uh, she writes that continental imperialism shared with overseas imperialism. So here we're making a distinction between the earlier imperialism that we talked about in chapters five, um, where capital went overseas to seek easy money and profits, with continental imperialism, where there wasn't empty land or quote unquote empty land, and therefore it's a little different than overseas imperialism. So continental imperialism, she says on 223, shared with overseas imperialism the contempt for the narrowness of the nation state. It opposed to it not so much economic arguments as an enlarged tribal consciousness, which was supposed to unite all peoples of a similar folk origin. Um, so again, uh, against the nation state, uniting people of uh, a particular Germanic, Slavic, or folk origin. Um, this is emerges in opposition to the state. And so on page 230, she talks about the state. And it's important for us to understand what she means by that. She writes, quote, The state inherited as its supreme function the protection of all inhabitants in its territory, no matter what their nationality, and was supposed to act as a supreme legal institution. The tragedy of the nation state was that the people's rising national consciousness interfered with these functions. And so this brings us to one of the really core um, uh, insights that, that come up over and again in this book, which is the paradox of the nation state. On the one hand, the nation state is a state, which is a legal entity, which as a legal entity treats all people within the territory as equal under the law. And on the other hand, the nation state is a nation state and it's comprised of different nationalities. Often there's a, a dominant nationality, for example, the, the Germans in Germany or the uh, uh, Czechs in Czechoslovakia. Um, and the, there's a desire for privileges for that nation state, that nation within the nation state. And this leads to a, a conflict because the premise of the nation state is, is opposed to that. And so the rising national consciousness, both of the dominant na nationalities, which want privileges, but also of the minorities, which don't have a nation state and want um, the privileges that come with having a nation state, uh, create conflicts that uh, lead to the decline of the nation state in this period. Um, for Arendt, uh, nationalism, as it emerges as this idea that everyone should have a nation state, is the expression, this is on page 231, nationalism is essentially the expression of this perversion of the state into an instrument of the nation. So nationalism is a perversion Right? and says that the state, which should be a legal entity treating all people equally, becomes an instrument of a particular nation or nationality. Now, tribal nationalism that begins to emerge is not nationalism. It doesn't seek to control a state. Um, the driving force behind continental imperialism, she argues, is tribal nationalism, and she writes on 229, it had little in common with the nationalism of the fully developed Western nation state. Um, in talking about this uh, rise of tribal nationalism, um, Arendt raises the question of the loss of human dignity, which is another theme that runs throughout this book. And on page 235, she writes, the tribalism of the pan movements, with its concept of the divine origin of one people, owed part of its great appeal to its contempt for liberal individualism, the ideal of mankind and the dignity of man. No human dignity is left if the individual owes his value only to the fact that he happens to be born a German or a Russian. But there is in its stead a new coherence, a sense of mutual reliability among all members of the people, which indeed was very apt to assuage the rightful apprehensions of modern men as to what might happen to them if, isolated individuals in an atomized society, they were not protected by sheer numbers 
and enforced by uniform coherence. So as this tribal nationalism emerges uh, and we begin to see ourselves as Germans or Russians or Jews and not as uh, members of a state, we lose um, this idea that we're all part of the human family, the dignity of man. Um, and uh, a new coherence emerges, right? Not based on being part of a, a territory or a people that has a tradition of a state, but of a, what she calls a pseudo-mystical a pseudo mystical idea that there's something about Germans that connect us just by being German um, or, or Slavic or whatever. And that this pseudo mystical idea uh, becomes increasingly important um, in a world in which we are homeless, isolated, atomized, and alone. And we begin to find meaning in this mystical uh, unity. Um, and, and, and this tribal nationalism, which she sees as uh, deeply opposed to both nation states, which again provide the idea of equality under the law, and deeply hostile to the idea of the dignity of man, um, uh, begins to emerge profoundly uh, in these movements of the pan-Slavic and pan-German movements in uh, the early 20th century. The second part of, of this chapter is on the administrative bureaucratic system and the inheritance of lawlessness. And here, uh, the point is the rise of bureaucracy, the kind of bureaucracy that we were talking about uh, with Lord Cromer in Egypt in chapter seven. Now, here she very helpfully, I think because there was some confusion about this last time, and here it's helpful, she distinguishes two kinds of bureaucracy. One is the bureaucracy that I think a lot of us are more familiar with. She calls it the deformation of the civil service. Um, it's the bureaucracy of the uh, governmental civil service that uh, has grown and grown and become unwieldy, inefficient, and vexatious, as she puts it. Um, so on page 244, she can say, government by bureaucracy has to be distinguished from the mere outgrowth and deformation of civil services, which frequently accompanied the decline of the nation state, as notably in France. There, the administration has survived all changes in regime since the revolution, entrenched itself like a parasite in the body politic, developed its own class interests, and become a useless organism whose only purpose appears to be chicanery and prevention of normal economic and political development. So as the civil service grows and as it corrupts itself, it becomes entrenched like a parasite in government um, and it becomes the source of inefficiency and vexation and in the end, it doesn't serve anybody's interest. It doesn't serve the left's interest. It doesn't serve the right's interest. It doesn't serve the government's interest or the state's interests. It doesn't serve the people's interests. It only serves its own interest in maintaining its power and uh, and, and and jobs. And and so she has a, a, a quite negative view of the civil service deformation, but it is, the civil service is still recognizably what we today often call bureaucracy. We may not think of it as so deformed, um, but that's what uh, she had in mind then. The second and more dangerous form of bureaucracy for um, her story of totalitarianism is uh, what she calls um, the pseudo-mystical bureaucratic machine. Um, and here she describes it again, mostly on page 244, and then again on 247, 248, as um, an, administrated, an administrative idea that, that renders law powerless. So again, as I said before, the state is a government by laws. The pan movements, first of all, elevate a pseudo-mystical idea of the tribal consciousness, 
but do more than that. They also elevate a pseudo-mystical idea of a one interest or one will of the bureaucratic machine. And since the machine is dedicated towards achieving that will, which is often mystical and hard to uh, unravel, there are lots of things that prevent that will from being actualized, and none more fully than the laws. And so the administrative state of the bureaucracy in this sense is designed to um, uh, render the law powerless. Uh, she writes on page 244, in governments by bureaucracy, decrees appear in their naked purity as though they were no longer issued by powerful men, but were the incarnation of power itself and the administrator only its accidental agent. These decrees are supposed to have a kind of, again, pseudo-mystical power, and they're supposed to tell you what's supposed to happen, even if they're not exact. They're supposed to get to the heart of the matter. And the, the excellent administrator, the excellent bureaucrat, the Lord Cromer, as in Egypt, is one who works behind the scenes in secret to roll out this idea uh, without being hampered by niceties like laws and rules and civil rights and things like that. Um, she says about laws on page 248 within an administrative machine, quote, laws were not only incompatible with the power of the mystical pan movements, they were sinful, man-made snares that prevented the full development of the divine. Once again, laws are these sinful uh, limits on the power of the machine. She writes on 247 that movements, quote, saw in bureaucratic regimes possible models of organization. A tremendous machine constructed after the simplest principles guided by the hand of one man. And again on page 249, it is the absoluteness of movements which more than anything else separates them from party structures and their partiality and serves to justify their claim to overrule all objections of individual conscience and, we might say, of laws. The leaders of the pan movements began to tell the mob that each of its members could become such a lofty, all-important walking embodiment of something ideal if he would only join the movement. So, this is, um, this is the second uh, part of the chapter, which is about the bureaucracy as a pseudo-mystical incarnation of a pan movement. And this pan movement uh, seeks anything, uh, power at all costs, absolute power, and seeks to overcome individual conscience and laws which would limit that power. Now, the third part of this chapter is on movements, and it's called Movements, Party and Movement. And um, here is, in many ways, the core of the chapter, as often happens in, in these chapters. The third section is, the, is where things really pick up. Um, and let's start at the very basics. On page 259, it's a little in, but it's the core of the idea. There are no movements without hatred of the state, right? We're talking about hatred of the state. We're talking about uh, movements that see themselves as absolute. What are the things that limit absolute movements? Laws, right? Individual conscience, classes, which divide people up, borders, but above all the state, because the state has rules. The state is governed by legality. And so movements are governed by a hatred of the state, and they arise partly out of um, the perceived failure of the liberal democratic state in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, the movements uh, for Arendt are governed by what she calls a mood. Um, so she can say on 250, long before Nazism proudly pronounced that though it had a program, it did not need one, pan-Germanism discovered how much more important for mass appeal a general mood was 
than laid down outlines and platforms. For the only thing that counts in a movement is precisely that it keeps itself in constant movement. This is one of the things that I think is most obvious and yet hardest to understand about movements um, in our end keeps itself in constant movement. It can't therefore have laid out plans and outlines because if you accomplish your laid out plan and outline, you're done. Um, and so it has to be governed. You can have outlines here and there and plans, but it has to be governed by a mood. It has to be governed by something overarching that we are going to accomplish. And RN offers, a, in a footnote, um, a beautiful example of this. She, well, she, she talks about how it's, um, uh, that the, the Nazis call this the systemzeit, the, 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 the time of the system. Uh, I'm sorry, this was on page 260, not 250. Um, and she says, uh, in a footnote, she says that there was an anecdote that, she, that was recorded by Berdayev about a young Soviet uh, citizen who goes to France and is bored. And he says there's no freedom in France um, because uh, the so-called French freedom was of the kind which leaves everything unchanged. And you get a sense of what these people thought freedom was. To move, to accomplish, to do things. Um, and that there was a lack of dynamism in sort of the old staid liberal states. And so she says on page 251, going back from 260, the decisive invention of the pan movements, therefore, was not that they too claimed to be outside and above the party system, but that they called themselves movements. And we have to really understand what this thing called a movement is. And so on 266, citing Carl Schmidt, she writes, the totalitarian state is a state in appearance only, and the movement no longer truly identifies itself, even with the needs of the people. The movement by now is above the state and people ready to sacrifice both for the sake of ideology. The movement is state as well as people and neither the present state nor the present German people can even be conceived without the movement. This is a profound um, idea that the movement takes over the state, takes over the people, and um, it comes from a deep hate of representative institutions, of the state, of laws, of anything stable. And it's an attempt, again, going back to basics, to provide a sense of meaning and purpose and life to people who are homeless, rootless, and lonely. Um, one of the things that's fascinating in this chapter is that Arendt distinguishes fascism um, from totalitarianism. And while fascism sort of had a movement-like element to it, um, it never fully uh, attacked the state. It was only a movement in name, she says, but once it gained power, it uh it lost its movement-like qualities because what all it really wanted was to control the state. Whereas the movements, the pan movements that turn into totalitarian movements, um, want to uh, destroy the state. And in the 1920s and 30s, post World War One, we have to remember all the countries in Europe, almost all, became dictatorships, um, and. Uh, not all, though, become totalitarian, and we need to ask why. But also, RN says, t only one, Great Britain, didn't become the dictatorship. Only one major state, and it was one that had incredible uh, dislocation, economic and otherwise. And she asks why. And she says that the reason is because in Great Britain, as in America, the Anglo-American states had a different political system one that was based in a two-party system as opposed to a one-party system. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, two-party system instead of a multi-party system. And the advantage of the two-party system is that each party would at some point take control of government, uh, eventually. And thus, each party saw itself as aiming to control the state, and control the state meant not be above the state, not destroy the state. There was a desire always 
for governing in Anglo-American political parties. Whereas in the multi-party uh, uh, system, uh, there were parties that never would rule. And even if a party ruled, it had to rule in coalition. And it saw itself not as trying to govern the state, but as to represent the interests of its party. In a sense, the two-party system, by moving people towards the center, which is what some people feel is the disadvantage of the two-party system, because it doesn't allow the two parties to represent uh, smaller segments of the population, the Green Party or the Working Family Party or um, the right-wing parties or whatever it is. The centralization of power, of, 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 of interest into the middle and into a governing coalition leads the two-party system for RN to be one that is a party of citizens, not of interested private individuals. And as a result, she thinks, that is the reason why the movements that took over in Europe and became dictatorial and authoritarian movements, and eventually in some places totalitarian movements, in the Anglo-American countries did not. They maintained a fidelity to a larger idea of the state and not of um, one party interest that wanted to rule above the state. Um, this chapter on, on, uh, on continental imperialism uh, is, 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 is somewhat difficult. It requires a lot of history. One thing I would really encourage you to do is, is read through the footnotes as you're going through it. I look forward to talking with you about it. Thank you very much and enjoy reading Hannah Arendt.